I'm not going to present you today anything um, about my Phrygian views. My topic, as the title says, is um, this link between mathematical cognition and mathematical uh, structuralism. So, let's begin. Most of the current uh, discussions in the philosophy of mathematics still evolves around its two main eternal questions. I would say what there is and what we can know. Most of the discussions concerning mathematical cognition are commonly judged and placed philosophically in the context of the <coughs> epistemology of mathematics. My intention, as I said, would be to see the philosophical relevance of some results in mathematical cognition for the ontology of mathematics, which uh, it's a still rare attitude in, in this domain. And um, as some of you may know, there is a explosive literature uh, concerning mathematical cognition and mathematical thinking. And um, my goal with today will be to survey at least the most important results of this literature and to connect them um, with um, structuralism. And what I'm going to do, I'm going first of all to present you some experiments and observations concerning mathematical cognition. So, we have these recent studies uh, and they show that we may find mathematical cognitive capacities in young infants and other non-human animals. And what is usually extracted from these studies is a form of intuitionism. And my claim, my main claim of the talk is that they should be further seen as endorsing a form of structuralism. How? Well, that's the outline of my talk. So, the introduction, um, a substantial portion concerning mathematical cognition with these uh, experiments and observations I mentioned before, in A's, very shortly, uh, some words about the intuitionism and another, well, I hope, um, not substantial chapter of my talk about structuralism, but the substantial link with structuralism. And the conclusion. So, historically, uh, we have this debate between empiricism versus innaism, especially in the 17th century. And the main question was, is our knowledge inherited or acquired? Today, well, in fact, yesterday, uh, we had the famous dispute between Piaget and Chomsky and Fodor and so on and so forth. And in a sense, I think everything goes back to Kant, Yet, in another sense, everything is linked to Plato. How? It's everything, right? Yes. Yeah. Everything are footnotes, <laughs> you know. So, we have this... Um, I put this two minutes of historical introduction into the theme, and after that, we'll jump directly to the uh, experiments. So, we have Plato in Meno, describing Socrates who is challenging the geometric intuitions of an uneducated slave boy, leading him through a series of questions to discover various relations among some squares drawn in the sound, which eventually led him to a form of Pythagoras theorem. And since the boy hasn't ever been exposed to geometry or anything else, or similar, Plato reached the conclusion that the slave must have always possessed this kind of knowledge, and that in fact, learning in general is nothing but recollection of what we have contemplated as immortal souls in the pure realm of ideas or forms. So, systematically, today, we still have this uh, debate in cognitive psychology and in general in cognitive sciences between empiricist and nativist. And uh, 
I would say that moreover, the nativists split themselves in strong and weak nativists according to the acceptance of the cultural construct thesis and the role of language in mathematical cognition. I'm going to explain it in a minute. So we have this um, classical debate between empiricists and nativists, but it's even a strong division among nativists between strong and weak because the weak nativists are saying that, okay, we are coming to the world with an inherited cognitive apparatus, but still we need to be exposed to society, to education, to language, to something in order to activate this apparatus. So, um, let's first tackle the role of language acquisition for some basic arithmetical cognitive abilities. <laughs> and secondly, I'll move forward to discuss the role of intuition and its philosophical importance for the ontology of mathematics. Now, concerning the relation between language acquisition and some basic arithmetical cognitive capabilities, there is a classic fundamental study. And this experiment was done by Kerry Wine and concerned the detection of arithmetical abilities in, I would say, very young infants, five to six months old. And the experiment is based on the violation of the expectation paradigm, namely the assumption that the subjects look longer at events that they do not expect, because these events are more interesting to them. And, by the way, this is a common property of human perceptual system that, for instance, magicians or orators rely on to capture the attention of their audience. So, in Wine's experiment, we have infants witnesses how a doll was placed on a stage. And a screen has lowered, hiding the doll, and they saw how a second doll was playing behind the screen. And if infants can perform, perform the basic addition 1 plus 1 equals 2, then they should expect to see two objects, in fact, two dolls, once the screen is lowered. Yeah? Just a property of dolls. Sorry? That's a property of dolls. It's not a property of numbers. What, what do you mean? Dolls stay where they are. And also the numbers are staying with the dolls. You're saying this is just about object preservation <laughs> rather than arithmetic. But yeah, yeah, that's. They might be wrong in interpreting that. Maybe he's going to say that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you know the experiment, or you just was playing with the dolls. Uh, and this difference, so they, they were measuring the difference in looking uh, time, and this difference in looking time is attributed to a capacity of the infants to discriminate between correct and incorrect arithmetical or arithmetic operations. Now, based on these results, Wayne claims that small infants have the ability to perform simple arithmetic operations as subtraction and addition with small numbers, one, two, and three. Now, further experiments done in this direction indicate that the experiment works for larger numbers as well, and similar results could be attained in the case of animals, a lot of animals. What is important here is to notice that we seem to have this innate proverbial arithmetical capacities to compute small integers. And what is interesting here is to notice that we share these mathematical innate capacities with other non-human beings, chimps, rats, crows, dogs, pigeons, dolphins, parrots, etc. There are a lot of experiments confirming these things. So, what is usually extracted 
from this type of studies is that these experiments endorse two interconnected basic claims. The first one is that language does not seem to play a fundamental role in the early stages of mathematical cognition. The second would be that they prove the existence of a form of innaism with respect to arithmetical knowledge. Now, a second classic experiment seems to concur with these findings. And this experiment is the, called in the literature the Snark effect. So you know this as well. Well, they are classic experiments. I'm just putting them together and trying to extract something else besides innaism and uh, intuitions. And that snark effect comes from spatial numerical association of response codes. And the experiments consist in asking adult people to indicate if a digit is odd or even. And the result is that the subjects respond faster to large numbers with their right hand and faster to small numbers with their left hand. So the subjects have like a normal uh, keyboard and they were asked very fast to say if a number is odd or even. And they discovered this, well, odd um, result which is uh, now confirmed not just for adults, but also um, for all kinds of uh, people and from all kinds of cultures, but I'm going to touch this. So, they claim that this must be because respondents are imagining the numbers on a number line, where smaller numbers are always to the left always to the left because they tested uh, at the beginning only adults from Western culture. But further experiments are saying that this experiment works for negative numbers as well. And also the direction of the line <coughs> is culturally dependent. So from people uh, coming from Islamic culture, for instance, it's the reverse direction. They are ordering the numbers from right to left. What is important here is to notice that we commonly order numbers in this imaginary line, which strongly suggests that in order to process mentally numbers, we need to previously arrange them in a line structure. Yeah. I must miss some. So, with Arabic participants, you got the, the reverse effect? You still get the line. But, the line, but this, the direction is, is, is yeah. Worse. So the data says so, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You, in fact, um, you have this article, Zebian 2005, right? And they replicated the experiments, but for different kind of subjects. I mean, from, coming from other cultures, and they <laughs> discovered that it works, but the line is reversed. Uh, I mean, in our, in our case, in our Western culture case, it works like that. So we are ordering numbers, starting with left and increasing them from left to right. And just, just, just a matter of the distinction between the data and theory. So yeah. the data is that uh, uh, Western people are uh, faster with, with the left hand for small numbers? No. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it was faster. Oh, you are uh, connecting with the... Yes. And In this case, we are faster with small hands. Uh, small numbers with, with, with the left hand. Exactly, and in this People case... From, from Arabic countries are faster uh, with the right hand with small numbers. Yeah. That's the data. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So let's put zero here. I mean, probably the Semitic languages are written from right to left. Yeah. So that's the. Sure. <laughs> but what's interesting uh, is that 
this internal linear structure seems to have a logarithmic distribution. And that means, and I think that's very interesting. And I, I'll say why. Uh, namely here, for instance, if we have a scale from 1 to, let's say, 100, the numbers are not placed as we usually would place them now, right? Having the same units, space units between them. No, 10 would be something like here in the middle. And the rest from 10 to 90 are contracted here. So we give more mental space to small numbers. That's the moral. And this is a, a very nice, this logarithmic scale is a very nice confirmation of what is called in cognitive psychology of Weber's. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> low. Uh, concerning the magnitude of stimuli and the um, uh, perceived intensity we have in our uh, cognitive system. So the correlation is logarithmic, is not uh, linear. As, and as I said, it indicates a kind of mental compression of large numbers. And in fact, that's normal because we are coming equipped to the world, as uh, the previous experiment showed, only to compute small numbers. So they are already there. And afterwards, somehow, we'll develop this ability to compute all the numbers. And uh, in practice, this means that um, the accuracy and speed of the calculation decreases as the numbers get larger. And the shift from logarithmic to linear scale occurs <coughs> later in the child development, sometimes, and this varies from person to person, during the first years of elementary school. And the transition is facilitated by the acquisition, I mean, most of the people in the literature says, of the successor function. This is a fundamental acquisition which marks the development from our basic inherited uh, arithmetic towards something more rigorous and elaborated. And in fact, some will say that are marking the transition from this so-called basic arithmetic to the real arithmetic we know. So education and language play their role in the development of mathematics, yet not in its very early stage. However, and now we have a third, um, I would call it experiment, but, uh, but in fact it was a kind of observation. Uh, and the street comes from uh, this Peter Gordon's report of Piraha population in 2004, when he published a well-known uh, article in Science. And he tried to reinforce the linguistic deterministic thesis that mathematics is language or is reducible to language. Now, very quickly, some things about these very interesting indigents. They are only around 350, living on the banks of Amazon, deep in the Brazilian jungle. Um, they were studied around 30 years by Daniel Everett, an American linguist and anthropologist. And he published in 2008 a famous book dedicated to this um, indigens called Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes or something like that. Now, based off on Everett's anecdotal reports, Peter Gordon an American cognitive psychologist conducted a number of experiments over a three-year period, and he has shown that Piraha language doesn't contain words for numbers larger than two. And in fact, as Everett has shown, what Gordon was identified as one, I know how to pronounce it, hoi, means in fact small amount, and the word for two, hoi, and 
hence the importance of accents in all the languages, <laughs> means relatively bigger amount. Um, the, the, one word. Exactly. <laughs> For one and two, imagine that. Uh, moreover, they do not have distinctive terms for colors and tents. For our perspective, their tonal language sound more like singing, whistling, and humming than a normal speech. They frequently change their names because they believe spirits regularly take them over and may change who they are. They have no creation myths tell no fictional stories, and have no art. Crime is rare among the Piraha. The only punishment they regularly practi practice is obstressing members of their society. And the uh, last quote about them, I mean, the last thing, it's a quote from Everett. And he says, if anything, they are superior in many ways to us, thinking too much about the future and worrying too much about the past is really unhealthy. The Piraha taught me that very lesson. Living in the moment is a sophisticated way to live. I don't see depression. So no arithmetic, no depression. Uh, so, what we have? now in our hands. Well, we have the fact that young infants and many other animals seems, seem to possess uh, some innate capacity to compute consistently small numbers, yet mature piraha lack these capabilities, mainly due to the limitation of their language. How could we deal consistently with these findings? So far the picture, I think, seems to be that we came into the world already equipped with some mathematical cognitive abilities, which will be further cultivated and expanded in contact with the social linguistic environment of adult communities. Um, what about higher mathematics? But before touching this issue, so what we have here, we have, well, Carol Wines, experiments, we have the Hins, and we have Gordon's. And Gordon is saying that um, there is no mathematical, in fact, no mathematics, no arithmetic um, outside language. And he came with this experiment. Whereas well, yes, the other are saying that no, we have this. And how can we deal um, consist consistently with that would be a picture like the following. We are coming equipped with this very basic apparatus, arithmetic apparatus. And after the impact uh, with our language and our culture and our education, we are going to develop this apparatus. Yet, if our language doesn't contain the necessary concepts, the numerical concepts, what we have here, it's inhibited. So this is why they don't even have what our small infants have. I mean, Piraha. And it's exactly like in the case of language. You know that if you don't learn any language in the first seven years of your life, that's it. You can't learn it anymore. And maybe the same would be here. So this numerical module, it's activated um, uh, and developed when it's put in a certain culture, but if not, that's it, it's lost. Okay, now what about higher mathematics or just mathematics? How does it emerge? That's a very um, controversial and still unknown transition from this basic arithmetic to our normal arithmetic. But the picture would be something like that. So 
Mathematics is highly constructive, and as we have already seen, it seems that we possess some basic innate mathematical capacities from the very beginning, which would further evolve under the exposure to social and linguistic practices into higher mathematical powers. And in the light of what it was presented so far, newborns apparently come already equipped with some cognitive numerical detectors, which will continuously evolve under the exposure of education until we'll eventually reach the mature mathematics of the adults. Further evidence that we have different cognitive modules for arithmetic and language is provided, for instance, by Butterworth. And he even identifies the number module in the inferior parietal cortex and discusses several clinical cases which can be di divided divided, sorry, in two, two main categories. The first one would be subjects who can speak fluently yet have great difficulties in doing even basic arithmetic operations. And secondly, we have subjects who can do even complicated arithmetic operations yet they could not read properly. So we have this clinical evidence between the, the thesis that arithmetic is just language, because we have people doing one thing and not the other. So, it seems that we are born with some fundamental recognition patterns concerning basic arithmetical operations over small numbers, which may further evolve into a vast diversity of mathematical structures. And these things, it's commonly interpreted in the literature only as innaism. And as you know, innaism or nativism means that we could find in humans and other species some form of innate knowledge. Namely, that we are born with a form of mathematical knowledge which is not acquired <coughs> through any social or linguistic experience, but inherited. Now, I don't consider appropriate to enter here into the world, uh, sorry, into the whole discussion concerning what it's inherited and what it's acquired with regard to our mathematical capacities. But I would like to mention that these capacities seem to be ontogenetically inherited, yet phylogenetically acquired through natural selection. And what I would rather discuss here is in fact that most cases, in most cases, this innaism is further seen philosophically as a form of Kantian intuitionism. And the literature is very rich in this sense. And following Kant, we may say that intuitions are objective representations. Moreover, intuitions are singular immediate representations, whereas concepts are general mediates one. So we have this picture, we have representations, and they split into conscious and unconscious representations, and we have subjective and objective conscious representations, and objective representations split at the end into intuitions and concepts. So that's the traditional Kantian picture. And intuitions are, as I said, objective, singular, direct representation. But representation of what? And in this sense, it seems that this inborn intuition is required philosophically a form of realistic grounding because we have to uh, put something outside which is giving us the intuitions. So, Intuitions following Kant could be seen either as providing the contents of our thoughts or as shaping our thinking capabilities. And I think that this second sense of pure forms of our sensibility is fruitful for our discussions. For the first sense is trivial and involves only empirical contents. And in this sense, intuitions should be seen as an inherited cognitive framework which gives us the possibility conditions to attain 
our mathematical knowledge of the world. So, thus again, the interesting thing about intuition is, as an epistemological claim placed in the context of cognitive studies, is that Uh, is that ontologically should be accompanied by a form of realism. Intuitions may shape our knowledge of the world only in accordance with the way the world actually is. And in this case, based on what we have said so far, the best form of realism needs to be a form of structuralism. Why? Well, structuralism is cognitively based on pattern recognition. And this seems to be exactly the mechanism we discovered in the previous experiments and observations concerning mathematical cognition. Why? Well, because in the course of evolution, humans and other animal species which share the same environment have internalized basic codes and operations isomorphic to the physical and arithmetical laws that govern the interaction of objects in the external world. And this internalization of structures gives to some organisms certain adaptive powers. And those it can be found as an inherited capacity, especially in the most evolved forms of life on Earth. So, summing up, it seems that modern intuition is based on innate arguments coming from the study of mathematical cognition leads to a form of structuralism. In order to be perceived, mathematical structures should both be inherited and be in the actual world. Natural selection selects and preserves, of course, selects, right? And preserves this isomorphism between the structures of our inherited cognitive arithmetical apparatus and the structures of the world. <coughs> So, mathematic may be seen as an encoding system, a way of translating the regularities of the outside world into a symbolic code of the inner world. And in this sense, mathematics is constructive. However, it preserves some essential inherited structures, and this explains its universal applicability. Now, I'm considering three kind of counter attacks to this um, account. The first one would be to say that, okay, these capacities to manipulate numbers may be inherited, yet it cannot be found in the real world, being just a social construction of our adaptable mind. Uh, the response would be that constructivism in this case cannot successfully explain the presence of mathematical cognitive abilities at individuals of other non-human species and small infants. So, since they are not exposed to any kind of language or education, we can say and adopt this constructive um, thesis. The second would be that mathematics, exactly as in the case of natural language, may possess some invariant traits. Yet, again, it cannot be found in the real world. Now, mathematics, of course, is a formal language, but it's not a natural, it's a formal one. And it's more than all natural languages, having a kind of univers universality that natural languages do not possess. And the third one would be that mathematical cognition, as known by us, is specific and restricted to Earth. And the, here the response would be, and we can make appeal to that uh, famous argument, namely that science is universal, and since science uses mathematical structures, then mathematics is universal as well. And our mathematics is the mathematics of the whole universe, and mathematical structures are universally distributed. So, and now that's the overview. We have these recent studies concerning mathematical cognition, and they endorse a form, I would say, of structuralism. How? Well, we have mathematical cognition, and from mathematical cognition, usually what we can extract, and that's a common point 
now in the literature, is this form of Inaiz. And this form of Inaiz, it's endorsing further a form of intuitionism. And here, I would say that in the context of mathematical cognition, we can go further and say that is this Inaiz and intuitionism, in fact, are giving us good reasons and grounds to say that we can endorse a structuralist position. Vielen Dank.